just as a starting point here, to, who, what, who watched uh, the Doctor in the House? Millions, millions <laughs> more, millions more uh, around the world. So, Ron, I just want to, you know, start the conversation uh, here. You know, you and I were in touch. Um, you made it look really easy on the on the show, and I know that you were in, you and I were in touch for six months as it was all going down. Can you just share a little bit about what it's like to actually be the doctor in the house every day? It's not as easy as it looks in the final edit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it like that. Um, Definitely the hardest six months of my career, uh, the most intense six months of my career, uh, but probably the six months I'm most proud of, I'd have to say. Um, that level of pressure yeah. um, to help some very complex patients who, you know, often this wasn't made clear. These are patients who have been under GPs, under specialists for many years, and so they're reason, their desire to go on a program where they really expose many aspects of their own life to millions of people. Um, you know, I always wonder why do people do that? But the reason is, and I, I thought long and hard about this, that these guys are desperate. They are looking for some solution to their illness, to their poor health, that they've not got so far from the, the conventional medical system. Now, that's not been derogatory about anyone or any doctor or any healthcare professional they've seen, but just the system, the way it is currently set up, was trying to help them, yet they did not feel as though they were getting that help. I think that really sort of fits the tone of today as well. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was tricky. Definitely two of those cases, I'd probably say, are two of the hardest cases of my entire career. Um, to put it in perspective, for every single show that you see edited, we film about 150 hours and you see 59 minutes of that. So a lot, um, you know, they try and tell as accurate a story as possible, but it's simply impossible to cover every aspect of what I've done um, with those patients. Yeah, one of the things I think is, is transformative about the show is I think it, it showed the world what's possible. Yeah. You know, I, I really feel that most people don't, you know, they think, oh, health and longevity is one thing, but if you get ill and if you have a chronic disease, it's, it's, you're not coming back. You're not coming back from that, and you're yeah. going to have to live with it. And I, what I've really appreciated about watching the show is just the degree to which you cannot think that anymore. And I'd love to, what, what, out of those, you know, you had cluster headaches, you had fibromyalgia, you had, you know, MS, serious diseases. Which out of those was, like, um, the, most, the most tricky to get the patient to realize that there was a chance of progress? Yeah, that's, that's a tricky question to answer, actually. <laughs> Um, I think there were varying degrees of difficulty with different families. The one that, that probably the standout one for me um, in terms of difficulty, both in terms of trying to come up with a decent outcome for that patient and their family, but also in terms of trying to um, embed some of the concepts that I could see and I, was, I could see in my head what I thought needed to happen for a patient to sort of start on that journey of health improvements. I think it was the last episode. Um, it was on very late on Monday, unfortunately. Um, but it was, it was Nicola who had a whole, you know, a, a, a shopping list of diagnoses, really. Um, and top of those were fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. And the reality is, and there's many doctors in the room, um, these are typically known in the profession as heart sink patients because we, you know, our hearts sink when these people walk through the door because our conventional model of looking at these problems really doesn't lend itself to, to a good outcome. You know, we really end up trying to find painkillers to manage their pain. Now, that has a role, there's no question, but... What about what's causing that in the first place? And one thing I did with Nicola, actually, which seems to have caused a, a ton of controversy in, in various forums, uh, <laughs> as, about as politely as I, <laughs> I, can, I can put it, um, is, is the analogy that I used right at the start. And so, you know, we've got to be aware that I don't normally go into uh, my consultation room with a train set <laughs> to demonstrate concepts to, to a patient. Although, Having said that, I might start because actually it did really work. So for those of you who didn't watch it, what I was basically faced with a patient who had a whole host of 
diagnoses, um, whether it's chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, anxiety and depression, irritable bowel syndrome, a thyroid issue, problems with her gut, and the list went on. And, and really something that I said to her really echoes with what Dr. Patel said in his presentation. I simply do not believe, and after 16 years of seeing patients, I don't believe that eight different things go wrong in their body as spontaneous random events. Okay? They were all being treated as separate conditions. And so the idea of that analogy was to simply say, I take this very, very seriously, and, but what I'm going to do is let's backtrack a little bit. Let's, for the time being, put these labels to the side, and let's just really focus on what's going on with your body. I think that has been misinterpreted by some to say I don't take fibromyalgia seriously, which could not be further from the truth. I take it very seriously. I think it's a real condition. I think um, that community feel as though many people don't regard it that way. That's certainly not the way I regard it. And my job with Nicola was to try and figure out what components in her lifestyle, what components in her body weren't functioning as well as they could. And a little bit like Sachin talks about, by creating health, on a cellular level with her, would some of these sort of downstream manifestations of these different names of diseases, would they you know, start to get better? And really, to get her from having fibromyalgia pains, which no one had managed to get on top of for over 10 years, well, you know, almost 10 years, to being pain-free to the point where she regarded herself as not having fibromyalgia symptoms anymore within six weeks, Probably one of the proudest things I've done in my entire career. Uh, and I must give a huge thanks to, to Michael Ash, who's standing at the back, who was a, a huge support for me during that whole, whole process. Um, doesn't mean she was completely better. There was much more to do with her. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, good, good for the family, we were unable to show all the improvements that have happened in Nicola's life since I walked out of her house for the last time in December. We're six or seven months on. On Easter Monday, I got a selfie sent by to me from her husband at the top of Rivington Pike. The, f uh, the three kids, husband and wife, including Nicola, sent me a selfie, said we made it. And that was her goal on day one. She, I said, what would you like me to do for you? So I'd love one day to be able to walk back up to the top of that pike. So I, I, you know, I had a tear in my eye reading that text message. I thought, you know what? This is why this is important, because you take it beyond that family, we've got eight families. I bet you, if you go and see them now, every single one of those families feel that it was well worth the intrusion and the whole process, because they're all doing well. The little lad Kiki, who we got to lose a stone and a half in six weeks when he's been to doctors and dietitians before, right? he's still doing well and thriving, and he's not worried about getting bullied. Emma, the lady with panic attacks and anxiety attacks, and she's had this for over 15 years. She's been to psychiatrists, doctors, counselors, therapists. We got a significant improvement in just a few weeks. She started her own business two months ago. This is real life for people. This is not telly. This is, of course, it's telly. And, 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 and I'm excited and really privileged to have the opportunity to showcase what is possible for eight families and I know for all the controversy that various things um, sort of get, actually I get every day so many messages on social media by people saying, wow, I've made this change, and this condition I've had for so long is now starting to, get is now starting to improve. And that gives me hope. That, and, and I want, the reason I, I do the show is, is quite simple. It's, it's to help these families, and that's my number one obligation is when I'm with them, it's how can I help these people get better? That's why I became a doctor. Yes, it happens that there's a camera in my face whilst I'm doing it, but really, particularly on this series, I really did switch off to that. And I just thought, okay, well, that will, that will happen. The editors will tell the story when they get all the footage in. I'll just focus on trying to be the best doctor. And for me, that means being the best possible human being that I can with that family. Um, and not only am I proud of the results, but I feel very lucky because I think many doctors would love the opportunity to have that sort of input and time. Um, so, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned time, actually, because if you read any article about Doctor in the House, it's like, well, he's got so much more time. And if you read um, opinion pieces from GPs and other doctors who are saying, oh, well, if I had that much time, I could do it. Now, 
one thing the BBC didn't know when they recruited you at the beginning is that you'd had this training in functional medicine. And I saw, speaking of Nicola, I saw you using the MSQ on the show, which is pretty amazing because that is a functional medicine tool. I'd just love for you to talk to, um, to the audience about how you feel about the, you know, the difference between really good medical practice time and also this other operating system of medicine that you're using on the show that is, is, is very clear to me. Yeah, it, it's, it's a really good point. The time issue is clearly very important, but it's actually not the most important thing at all. It's a completely different approach, an, an approach that I could not have taken five years ago. So I could have got the gig to do Dr. Nas five years ago, and you would have seen a very different series and very different health outcomes, because I did not, despite my training, despite being a member of the Royal College of Physicians, despite being a member of the Royal College of GPs, Despite all that training, I could not have done with the majority of those patients what I have done on this series. And I think this series for me took it a lot further than the first series. We really, I think it was quite obvious to a lot of doctors actually that this is not just about more time. On, on, on the flight here, um, I, I flew at Sagunza from Manchester Airport and, and I bumped into three SHOs. So they're senior house officers, so they're probably about um, maybe two or three years out of medical school. And, um, you know, they, they came up to me and said, oh, are you the doc on telly? And I still find that really bizarre. <laughs> um, and I said, well, yeah, I, I think so. I think so, you know, I kind of felt a bit sheepish. And I'm always nervous about what a conventional doctor is going to say to me at that point. But they were so complimentary and they said, well, you know, we found it inspiring. We'd love to learn how you do that. And, and that gives me a lot of hope. And that's something that I'm keen to do going forward is to actually teach doctors in the UK specifically doctors, because I think nutritional therapists are an organization who have got fantastic training and they understand some of these concepts. But I think some of these concepts are quite alien for doctors. And it, and it goes beyond just a bit of nutrition. There's some real complexity in managing these patients that is simply not possible to show on a BBC One 9 p.m. show. Just simply not possible, because it's the kind of show that I, as a doctor, would love to see, but I think the public would switch off to that if, you, if we went into the real biochemistry of what was going on. Yeah. So I think the way we think about patients, w the, w the approach I said was fundamentally different mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, not all of them, from what a conventionally, what a conventionally trained doctor would typically do. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, and I know everyone probably wants, who wants to see some women on stage? We're about ready for that, right? Yeah, that's coming. It's coming. The future of medicine is female, and uh, just like everything else, so uh, the, the dude show is coming to an end. But I do want to ask you about Alzheimer's, because, because Alzheimer's is a disease that is growing. It's really uh, tragic, and I, I have a family history of it myself, but one of the biggest things is, is that not just the cost of the doctors and the medicine and the drugs and all that kind of stuff, but actually the cost of care because you need three to four full-time people to take care of one every Alzheimer's patient. You know, in our last functional forum in June, it was the evolution of neurology, and we featured the work of Dr. Dale Bredesen. And some of the times that we get to hang out is when you're coming to America yeah. to work and train with him. And um, I know you've been sort of one of the foremost doctors going through the training with him. Can you share with the audience just a little bit of what he's doing and what your hopes are for the future of Alzheimer's? Yeah, so there's, there's a chap called Professor Dale Bredesen, who, who interestingly has been studying Alzheimer's disease for over 30 years. His goal at that time was to find the drug cure for Alzheimer's. And maybe five or six years ago, he, he will share that he figured out that that is probably unlikely. And the reason he feels it's unlikely is because he identified, he at that point had identified 36 different pathways in the body that could go wrong in Alzheimer's. And he thought, well, the drug might manage one of those pathways pretty well, but it ain't going to manage all 36. So he shifted his thinking to really what is a functional medicine way of thinking, which is looking as the body is connected, looking at what has been going on in that patient's life that is causing the brain to start making changes, uh, which we call Alzheimer's. So he's not saying, oh, this is Alzheimer's disease. What is the cure? He's saying, okay, this is Alzheimer's in this patient. What are the factors that have driven this patient towards Alzheimer's over the last 20, 25 years? And remarkably, a key part of his strategy to not only prevent it, but he has published some of the very first case studies of reversing the memory loss that you get in 
uh, mild to moderate, sorry, in, in early Alzheimer's and the, and the condition just preceding Alzheimer's. So it's very important Alzheimer's do, for, to understand that Alzheimer's doesn't just happen. We don't just wake up with it one day. It has been building up in our bodies for a good 20 years. So for many of us, particularly once you get over the age of 40, not quite there yet, um, what we're doing day in, day out, actually is going to have an influence over whether we get Alzheimer's later. Um, but a key part of his strategy is, you know, I can relate it to the Nicola case, is really actually looking at that patient and trying to get everything working as well as possible. So he says we need to treat these Alzheimer's patients like athletes and actually look at all these 36 different pathways and get all of them humming and working really, really well. And a key part of his strategy is nutrition and lifestyle. It's, it's phenomenal, and I've met some of the patients who've been through this, and, and I've seen video footage of them before and after. This stuff not only works, it is life-changing. People are going back to work. So my hope for this is, you know, I'm now teaching a few doctors in the UK. I was lecturing in Dublin last weekend about how we implement aspects of Dale Bredesen's protocol. It is so different from the way that the medical system is currently set up that it is very hard just to teach doctors and then they implement that in their 10-minute appointments. It needs a bit of a, uh, a sort of system change. But there is huge interest in it, and I am I'm in talks with people at the moment how we teach doctors, how we can start implementing that. Because on one hand, the NHS is the ideal place to do it, because if you can get it into one practice, you can get it into every practice. So if we can prove the concept, we can get it everywhere. But the take-home for people is that actually we can influence whether we're going to get Alzheimer's or not. And it starts right here, right now, and it starts today. That's really empowering. And the lessons that we learn from Alzheimer's are actually applicable to all of these diseases. The same operating system happening in the background. I know one of the reasons that Dale Bredesen said that he chose to work with the Institute for Functional Medicine and the functional medicine community is because the functional medicine community is already treating the cause, working out what the individual cause is in the individual patient and working with them. And he's identified these different subtypes of Alzheimer's. It's not happening for the same reason. And so we're very, very excited to see that all of those lessons that you're learning there are universally applicable. Well, it's, it's what I, I, I say. I did a, I did a TED talk on, on making diseases disappear. And the, the conclusion is basically, what if all these seemingly separate conditions, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's type 2 diabetes, whether it's depression, what if actually, uh, when you strip them back to their core, what if they've got the same driving factors? And I think when you really start understanding how the body <coughs> works, and, and again, I go back to Sachin's talk about getting the cell working well. If, if that is working well, everything downstream of that tends to work well. So Absolutely. May, thank you. Thank, I just want to have a round of applause for Ranga and everything that he's done. <coughs> I know, uh, you know, He's, he's, he's just getting started as well. I'm, I'm excited to see that maybe the BBC is going to package this and sell it to all kinds of other places now they've done enough episodes. The BBC is a random institution that makes a four-episode or three-episode series. In America, we have 26-episode series. So now we've oh got at God. least... Uh, <laughs> at least Mike, where are you? <laughs> get the bat phone. Um, but seriously, you know, you could probably make 26 episodes with all the extra footage. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's the thing. We, half the stories that we did are not in the edit. Because we, we, uh, in each family, there were three to four family members that I helped. But you'll see in the show that only half of those stories have been shown because there's too, it was getting too complicated. There was too, you know, <laughs> there's too many health problems out there. So there's a lot of things that just weren't shown, unfortunately. Absolutely.